Hello and welcome to a digital lecture for Calculus 2 at Salt Lake Community College. In this video we're going to go through section 7.8, the concept of improper integrals. Now up to this point we've been using integrals with finite bounds, or we've been assuming that we have finite bounds with no discontinuities in between. However, that's not always the case, depending on the sciences you're dealing with, particularly physics. A lot of times we're trying to consider what happens if we were to approach either x or y in the infinite direction. Um, if that is the case, then we would have in integrals that would look something like this, with either infinity in the bound, negative infinity in the, in the bound, or both infinity and negative infinity. However, these are going to be called improper integrals because infinity should not be treated the same as a normal finite number. Um, and therefore, having infinity in a bound does not really make sense. It is a concept. It is a state that we approach. We cannot get to it, though. Therefore, we need to separate that out. The way that we are going to separate that out of the integral is by using a limit instead. We'll put a limit in front of the integral and have a variable approaching that. That way the integral that we have is still defining finite values. Just one of those values will be constantly increasing or decreasing approaching either of our infinite bounds. This is shown down here where we have our two examples of improper integrals with just one single infinite bound. So if I have from a to infinity, where a is any number, then I'm going to make that the limits of b to, infin uh, to infinity of the integral of a to b. So b is going to be my infinite bound there. Likewise, if my infinite bound is a negative infinity, then I can replace that with a variable a and make that a limit as a approaches negative infinity. So this is what we're going to do with most of these. However, solving the integrals isn't going to change. We are still going to solve the integral as we normally would, but then we would plug in one of those variables for the limit and then uh, evaluate a limit of that function with the variable plugged in, either a or b. If we say that the limit um, that we find yields a finite value, we thus say that the integral converges. Otherwise, it, it diverges. It either goes to infinity or negative infinity. Um, or it's bouncing around between things. For example, the integral of sine neither goes to infinity or negative infinity as you, as you approach x, uh, as x approaches infinity, um, because it keeps increasing or decreasing depending on what interval you have. So if you go another pi distance, then you would have a different area than you, if you would go two pi distance. Um, so either of those. Um, you can also have integrals where we have double infinite bound. Uh, as I show here, if you have a, a positive infinity and negative infinity for bounds. If that's the case, we're simply going to split that up into two integrals, from negative infinity up to a constant, and then from that constant up to infinity. So some number in between negative infinity and infinity. And then we're going to define a limit for both of those integrals. Now, depending on where you see this, you will oftentimes see c written as 0. However, that might not be the most convenient thing to use as a constant, although in most cases it is. Uh, you can use any number. So if you want to use from negative infinity up to 1, and then 1 to infinity, that works fine. However, a lot of times c equals 0 will be very useful. Okay, so overall, we're just changing it into a proper integral, putting a limit out front, and solving the integral as normal. Okay, um, one last thing before we dive into a couple examples is that you do need to be careful of what the original function is, and you have to make sure that it is defined over that entire interval uh, that is in the integration bounds. So, for example, if you have the function tangent of x, which has lots of asymptotes, then that might not be completely defined if I have it, say, go from 0 up to infinity. It's actually not defined at an infinite amount of places within that range. So we do need to be careful of things like that. Okay, here's an example that we can work with. We have negative infinity up to negative 1, uh, x e to the next negative x squared, dx. And we're going to solve this just like we would normally. Okay. First though, what we're going to do is we're going to make this no longer an improper integral. To do so, we're going to put a limit. And I see a negative infinity there on the bound at the bottom. So I'm going to say 
A approaches negative infinity. Now we tend to use A for a bottom and we tend to use B for a top if we need to. However, you can use any variable you want to. So if you don't like to use A and B, if you want to use Y or some other variable, go ahead. We'll say limit of A going to negative infinity of the integral A to negative one, X E to the negative X squared DX. Now looking at the expression, just to check x e to the negative x squared, I can plug in all the values between negative infinity and negative one into x in all those cases, and I still receive a real value. So it is defined within that entire range, so I don't see any other problems I need to deal with. Now at this juncture, I can deal with this as I would typically. Uh, this I see as x e to the negative x squared. This looks like a u sub. So we'll say u equals negative x squared du then is negative 2x dx so du divided by negative 2 equals x dx and we can simplify this to be limits as a approaches negative infinity a whoop let's put that a uh, negative one half out front integral of a to negative one, which I'll deal with in a second, of e to the u du. And now for the bounds, I can change that appropriately. If I have u equals negative x squared, that means a is becoming negative a squared. And if I put negative one to that, negative one squared is one times a negative one is still negative one. And this should just give me the limit as a approaches negative infinity of negative one half e to the u. And this integrated from negative a squared to negative one. Then if I apply those bounds, first negative one, we get negative one half times e to the negative one, and then we would subtract e to the negative a squared. And notice throughout all this, I've just dealt with this integral as normal once I pulled out the limits, and I just plugged in that variable of a squared. Now that I'm at this case where I'm done with the limits, or I'm done with the integral and I've plugged in the bounds, now I can deal with this as a limit and evaluate what happens as a approaches negative infinity. Well, as a approaches negative infinity, that means a squared is approaching infinity. And that means negative a squared is approaching negative infinity. And e to the negative a squared, that's approaching e to the, you could think about this as negative infinity. And if we think about e, e looks like this graph. So if we approach negative infinity, this is getting closer to zero. So this term goes to zero. Therefore, for this, we get negative one half e to the negative one minus zero, or just negative, uh, if I put e to the negative one is one over e, so negative one over two e. And that'd be my answer. So this one converges. And that's it. So we're still using the same methods we've used up to this point. We're applying U substitution by parts, whatever we need to, to solve the integral. The only thing we're adding is the limit out front and then evaluating for that limit to think about what happens to this expression as I approach whatever infinite bound. All right, let's move on to another example here. We have the integral of two to infinity, natural log of x over x squared dx. Again, first thing I'm going to do is change this into a proper integral by taking that infinity, replacing with a b, and saying limits of b approaching infinity. Again, I just like to use b up top and a down to the bottom because that makes it look more like the definition of an integral. Any variable you want to is fine. Integral of 2 to b, 
natural log of x over x squared dx. And we solve this like normal. This one, we see a natural log. That's going to key us to try to use biparts. That's usually natural log is typically using biparts. So we'll say natural log of x. That's going to be our u. And so du is going to be 1 over x dx. And that means dv would have to be the rest of it, dx over x squared. And if I take the antiderivative of that, or the integral of that, we get negative 1 over x. So this is going to be limits as b approaches infinity. And then if I do the biparts, I have u times v, so negative natural log of x over x minus v du, but that minus on the v will make it plus integral of 2 to b of v du, so that's 1 over x squared because that's 1 over x times 1 over x. All right, so even though this part has been solved, we are going to apply the bounds to that, but we'll deal with that in a moment. So this is also defined from 2 to b. We can solve that second integral now. So we get negative natural log of x over x minus this is going to turn into another negative 1 over x. And these are all going to be taken from 2 to b. Okay. Let's see what we get here. We have the limit as b approaches infinity of, if I plug in b first, I get negative natural log of b over b minus 1 over b. Then minus, if I plug in 2, we get negative natural log of 2 over 2 minus 1 over 2. By the way, we kind of skipped through this, but 2 to b, that's defined over this entire expression. Natural log of 2 is fine, and anything above that is fine, and anything going higher is okay. So everything should be okay. Now for both of these, uh, this is a constant, so we don't really need to worry about this right now. We'll see what happens with the rest. Uh, 1 over b, as b approaches infinity, this one is obviously going to approach 0, because it's going to approach 1 over a really large number. Natural log of b over b, though, is not as obvious, because natural log of b approaches infinity, and b approaches infinity. So this is an indeterminate form, but if we apply L'Hopital's, so for this piece, if we have limits of b approaches infinity, of negative natural log of b over b, and we apply L'Hopital's rule, which is taking the derivative of the top and the bottom, we can find this limit. The derivative of the top is 1 over b, the derivative of the bottom is 1, so we get negative 1 over b overall. And so this is also going to approach 0, so that's what this expression does. If you need a refresher over L'Hopital's rule for limits, I would recommend going back and reading up on that, because L'Hopital's is very handy to solve some of these if necessary. All right, so these approach 0, so overall the limit is irrelevant because all of this will approach 0, and we just get the answer of minus negative natural log of 2 over 2 minus 1 half, or if we apply the negative, we get natural log of 2 over 2 plus 1 half. So this is also convergent. All right, let's do another one. We have the integral of e to infinity of 1 over x natural log of x dx. Okay, again, checking these bounds. e is about 2.7. I can plug anything 2.7 or higher into x, that's fine. Natural log of e is 1, and then anything higher just becomes larger. So this is okay. There's no problems with the bounds here. But I do need to still replace infinity with a constant or with a variable. So we'll say b of 1 over x natural log of x dx. 
This one's a little bit simpler than the last one. This one we can actually do with a u sub. u is natural log of x. du is 1 over x dx, which is what we see here and here. So this integral becomes the limit of b approaching infinity. Again, we'll deal with the bounds in a second. Of 1 over u du. In this case, if we think about the bounds, um, u of e, so if we plug in e into the natural log, we get 1, and u of b, we get natural log of b. So we can just replace those with 1 to natural log of b. And from that, we get the limit of b approaching infinity of, of the integral of 1 over u becomes natural log of u from 1 to natural log of b. Okay. This one, because natural log of b is a little bit uglier, what we can't consider is that as b approaches infinity, natural log of b also approaches infinity. So I can just call natural log of b another constant. We could say c, so we can say this is limit of c approaching infinity of natural log of u from 1 to c. It's a little bit easier. You don't need to do this, but I think it's nicer so you don't have a natural log of a natural log. And then we get the limit of c approaching infinity. If I plug in all of this, we get natural log of c minus natural log of 1 which is itself zero. But the natural log of c, as c approaches infinity, we already defined that up here. This is just also going to approach infinity. So overall, this is approaching infinity, so this is divergent. So this is an example of one that led to a divergent integral. All right. Now that's how most of those go. So really we're just introducing a limit, maybe evaluating a limit at the end if necessary. A lot of times it will be relatively simplistic. This will lead into one of my favorite examples though. And if you've been looking at the thumbnails for these videos and wondering why I have a picture of an angel with a, uh, a trumpet, and that's the main picture for the thumbnail itself. This is the reason. This is what is called Gabriel's Horn, and one of my personal favorite problems, and, and will help relate to some other concepts that we can have with this section. Um, Gabriel's Horn, sometimes known as Torcelli's Trumpet, um, is basically when you take the function 1 over x and rotate that around the axis, the x-axis, from 1 to infinity. And what we're going to be able to do is calculate what the volume of that would be as if we were to use the same um, concepts from section 6.2. So if we draw that, what this looks like, the graph of 1 over x looks like this, where it approaches the x-axis but never touches. It just gets smaller and smaller. 1 over 10, 1 over 20, 1 over 100, etc., etc. And then from 1 to infinity means from this point up to infinity, we rotate that around the x-axis, and we get this trumpet shape. So the x and y-axis. So if we rotate that around the x-axis, we get that trumpet shape. All right, so we know from section 6.2, uh, because we're just rotating around the x-axis and the way that I drew this, cross section, I can just do this using um, washers and disks. So I can evaluate this volume as pi r squared. So we'll say v equals pi from 1 to infinity are my bounds of r, which is 1 over x squared dx. If I make this into a proper integral, we have the limit as b approaches infinity of pi from 1 to b 
1 over x squared dx. That's a relatively easy integral. Nothing I really need to do fancy there. This will just lead to pi. This integral becomes negative 1 over, uh, negative one over x. So we'll say negative pi over x. And this from 1 to b. And then if we plug in those, we get limits as b approaches infinity of, if we even take out that negative pi, we get 1 over b minus 1 over 1. Now, 1 over 1 is just a constant. That's easy. But 1 over b, as b approaches infinity, we've done this already, this is going to approach 0, 1 over a really large number. So overall, we get negative pi times negative 1. This will just equal pi. Therefore, what we found is that if we take this horn, which is a horn that, that has the, the flare part of the horn up front and then the, the nozzle where the, the mouthpiece really would be, that extends infinitely. This horn has a finite volume, is what we've shown now. So this is a finite volume. It has converged to this amount. So kind of strange when you try to think about this trumpet shape. Although in your mind, you may be thinking, okay, well, yeah, as I approach this end where it's getting really thin and really narrow, it makes sense that eventually the volume should close up, more or less, that there should be a finite amount of space I can have inside of this horn. The reason I like this problem is not just because of the volume, but what uh, you can calculate as well with this. And what you can also calculate is the surface area of this horn. Now, the surface area formula is something that we will discuss more in depth starting in section 8.2, which is dedicated to surface area. But for now, this is the formula for surface area if you have your function f of x. It's 2 pi from a to b f of x square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. So a little bit complex. Again, we'll, we'll uh, find this and we'll prove where this comes from when we get to section 8.2, but for now we're just going to use it. All right, so let's use this formula to find the surface area of Gabriel's horn. Well, our function is 1 over x, and if we take the derivative of that, because we'll need the derivative for the uh, formula, f prime of x is negative 1 over x squared. So we'll get the surface area to be 2 pi, again from 1 to infinity, of 1 over x square root of 1 plus negative 1, x, 1 over x squared squared dx. All right, so apply a couple things. We can make this a proper integral, like we did before. Of 2 pi, 1 to b. 1 over x and that square root, we can simplify a little bit on the inside. Negative 1 over x squared squared becomes 1 over x to the fourth. So we have 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth dx. And what we notice here is that 1 plus 1 over x to the 4th we can simplify. Limit as b approaches infinity. The 1 over x to the 4th and the 1 plus, we can make the 1 equal to x over 4 or x to the 4th over x to the 4th. So we have x to the 4th plus 1 over x to the 4th. And then that x to the fourth can come out of the square root. It can come out of the square root as an x squared. So we get the limit as b approaches infinity of 2 pi from 1 to b. The x squared comes out, so we get 
x cubed. And on top we get the square root of x to the fourth plus 1. And on the bottom we have x squared from here and then x from here. So overall x cubed dx. All right. At this point, this integral is rather difficult to solve. You can try to do this using trig substitution. However, we have a little bit of a sneakier way of dealing with it. If we look at that inside, if we just look at this expression here, the square root of x to the fourth plus 1 over x cubed, what I notice is that x to the fourth plus 1, that square root, over x cubed, that's going to always be larger than the square root of x to the fourth over x cubed because it has a plus one on top. So therefore that expression is always going to be larger. Well, this square root of x, uh, square root of x to the fourth, that's x squared. And x squared over x cubed is just one over x. So we know that this expression is always going to be larger than the integral of one over x. So we have that this is going to be larger than the limit as b approaches infinity of 2 pi 1 to b of 1 over x dx. And this limit we did before, this is the limit as b approaches infinity of 2 pi, the, uh, the integral of 1 over x is natural log of x. from 1 to b. And again, we've done this integral before that resulted in natural log. We just did that. This is going to go to infinity. So this diverges. Now, we didn't prove that the original thing diverged, but what we proved was something smaller than it diverges to infinity. So if we show that something smaller than it has an infinite surface area, then that means anything larger than that also has an infinite surface area. Therefore, our original surface area diverges. That is what I think is very interesting about Gabriel's horn. The volume we defined as finite, meaning that if you were to take that horn and say fill it with paint, you can put in a finite amount of paint in there. So we would take a finite amount of paint cans to fill the entire horn. However, if you were to try to take that paint in the horn and either paint the outside of the horn or the inside of the horn, you don't have enough paint. You will never have enough paint. The volume is finite, but the surface area is infinite. It's very weird, and a lot of people consider that a paradox. So that's what I like about Gabriel's horn. But what I also like is that this shows us a way of dealing with an integral, particularly to show how an integral converges or diverges without solving it directly. This integral we had, whoop, wrong one. Um, this integral that we had up here, this is very hard to solve. It takes some uh, maneuvering. You can probably do it with trig substitution, saying x squared is uh, tangent, but it does not solve very well. This instead had us solve a much easier integral, showed that that integral diverged, and we got a result from that. So we didn't need to solve the original integral. That is going to lead to one of our most useful tools with these, which is called the comparison theorem. The, compar the comparison theorem states that if you have continuous functions f and g, if f is defined as being greater than g uh, for all x greater than a, um, so basically from a to infinity or 1 to infinity, whatever values, so from up, up to an infinite sense, if this is always true, it, uh, that one function is always greater than the other one, so if f is always bigger than g, that means then that if f is convergent, which means it goes to a finite amount, then that means g is convergent. This is because if f, we can define 
as this finite area, and G fits inside of that somehow, then that means G is finite. If G, though, is infinite, it expands infinitely in terms of its area, and F is larger than that, then that means F is also infinite or divergent. So that's going to be the comparison theorem. And we just did an instance of that. We found a function that was smaller. So we found the function g that was smaller than f. And we found then that f was going to be divergent because g was divergent. So keep in mind that with the comparison theorem, whichever one you're trying to do, if you're trying to show it's convergent, then you're trying to find a function that is uh, explicitly larger than it at all times. If you're trying to show something is divergent, then you're trying to find a function that is explicitly smaller than it at all times. We found a function that was smaller. We found that 1 over x was smaller than our original function at all times. And so because of that, and we showed that 1 over x was divergent, that meant that our original function was also divergent. The one that we use explicitly is going to be one of the most useful ones where you just have one over X to something. And so what we also want to do is establish those. Um, if you have one over X to any power, we did it with X to the one power. We know that one over X uh, to the one power is divergent because the integral of that goes to natural log. However, what if P is any other power? What if I'm comparing to one over X squared? Or what if I'm comparing to one over x to the one half? I want to know how all of these act um, just in general. So we have here, a this is already worked out in terms of how you would do this. The integral of one to infinity of one over x to the p, you would make that into a proper integral. And then you can write x uh, one over x to the p as x to the negative p. And then when you take the integral of that, you get a new uh, exponent of negative p plus 1, which then you divide by that. And then when you plug in 1 to b, you have that division of 1 over negative p plus 1. b plugs in, you get b to the negative p plus 1. And 1 plugs in, so you get minus 1. However, this will then split up into cases, because it will act differently depending on what the value of the power is, which is what we're representing as p. If p is less than 1, then that means this negative p plus 1 is going to be negative. So this would be a negative exponent. Sorry, not a negative exponent, a positive exponent. Because if p is less than 1, say it's a fraction between 0 and 1, then this would add up to a positive number. Um, or if p is a negative number, then that means negative p would become a positive value, plus 1 would be more positive. So this would be b to a po positive number. So b to a positive number minus 1. And if that's the case, this is going to go to infinity. So it diverges. If p is greater than 1, then that means b to the negative p plus 1 is overall going to be a negative exponent, which will make it flip into 1 over b to that exponent. And this is going to go to 0, which means all you have left over is negative 1 times this constant, which is a convergent series. Combining that with the fact from the previous problem that if p was equal to 1, so if we had just 1 over x to the 1 power integral, we knew that that was natural log of x, which is divergent. That means that we have the general formula right here for these types of integrals. The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx, this will diverge if that power is less than or equal to 1. And it will converge if the power is greater than 1 explicitly. This doesn't have a particular name, but it will compare to something that we'll use even more moving forward, particularly when we get to chapter 11, 
Um, these will be called P series when we talk about series and sequences. Uh, this doesn't have a particular name, but in order to refer to these, I will refer to these as P integrals, though that's not necessarily the official name. Okay. Now, we can use that to solve a majority of the problems, and we will be able to use that to solve most of these problems here. And these four examples, all we're going to do is try to show whether they converge or diverge. We don't care if we need uh, what they converge or diverge to, just if they do. All right, so we have integral of 2 to infinity cosine squared x over x squared. Well, we see that x squared there, so maybe I want to compare that to 1 over x squared. If I'm trying to compare it to 1 over x squared, though, this converges. So that means that I want to show that this function is less than 1 over x squared. That would then show that this integral I have also converges. Well, cosine squared x over x squared. Cosine squared x, we know that cosine of x is defined as between negative 1 and 1. And if I square that, cosine squared x is going to uh, square all my negative positive or negative answers to go up to 0 to 1. So that means the top is always going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. And since that is always less than or equal to 1 itself, that means this entire function is less than or equal to 1 over x squared. Because cosine squared x is always less than or equal to 1. Therefore, we have the integral from 2 to infinity of cosine squared x over x squared is less than or equal to, by the convergent theorem and by the p integrals, 2 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx, which is convergent by p integrals. And that's it. That's all we need to do. So essentially, a lot of these we'll just need to compare to something and talk about whether that is convergent or divergent and stop there. A lot of these should be pretty short. The second one, unfortunately, we see e to the x. That doesn't really look like a p integral because that's not x to some power. That's e to the x, so that doesn't really work. However, I can, this integral by itself is not easy to solve, but I can make it easier to solve if I just get rid of that x part. So let's see what happens if I have the integral from 1 to infinity of just 1 over e to the x, dx. Well, if I work with this integral, if I had that x plus e to the x, this would always have a, a larger denominator, which means that this would strictly be smaller than this integral. Therefore, like in the previous problem, if we can show that this is convergent, then that means the original integral will be convergent. So let's see what this integral goes to. If this is convergent, then we're good. If this is divergent, then that means that we didn't solve anything. We showed something was smaller than something that diverges, which is not conclusive. Uh, this is the limit as b approaches infinity of 1 to b of e to the negative x dx, which is the limit as b approaches infinity of negative e to the negative x from 1 to b. If we plug in b, we get negative e to the negative b plus e to the negative 1. And e to the negative b is the same thing as 1 over e to the b. And as b gets larger and larger, that will become e to the, uh, 1 over e to the really large exponent. This will go to 0. So we have here the answer of this is e to the negative 1. So, therefore, since this is convergent, that also means then 
that our original function was convergent. So that's all we need. So maybe I'll type that here and we'll say that since uh, 1 over e to the x is convergent and is strictly larger than our integral or our original integral, then by the comparison theorem, our original integral is convergent as well. Something like that. All right, so that's what I'd be looking for, really. That's, that's what we would be looking for to solve this. Uh, we showed how one thing interacts, but if I just show that this goes e to the negative one, that doesn't really solve it. You need to make this statement of why, like in the last one I said convergent by p integral. Um, that was enough to kind of prove the whole thing. This one we need a little bit more information. Okay, let's do a couple more. This one looks kind of like the last one. We have the integral of 3 to infinity, 1 over x minus e to the negative x dx. Now, this one, however, we have the x minus e to the negative x. So that means this bottom is always going to be a little bit larger than 1 over x. This is always going to be a little bit larger than the integral of 1 over x dx because the denominator would have uh, be smaller because we would be subtracting by some uh, positive amount. e to whatever is always a positive value. So when I subtract that away, the denominator is always going to be smaller, which leads to a larger value. So this is always going to be larger than 1 over x dx. And therefore, I can say something like, if I want to type this out again, I could say that since our original integral will always be larger than the integral of one over x uh, of one over x over the same bounds, that is important from three to infinity. So over the same bounds, then by p integrals our original integral diverges since 1 over x diverges because in this case p equals 1. Something like that. Look how quick that was. That's how a lot of these will go. You just need to find a comparison show that it is true, and as long as you know that it's true, then you're good. Last one. Over the same bounds, 3 to infinity, 1 plus 3 sine to the fourth of 2x over square root of x. Well, this 3 sine squared 2x is complicated, or sine to the fourth of 2x is complicated, but again, we know that sine of x is from zero to, is from negative one to one and if you were to take all those values to the fourth and then multiply by three then this is going to be between zero and one or times three to three so somewhere between zero and three so therefore this is always going to be one plus something, something between 0 and 3 over square root of x. So that means this is always going to be slightly larger than the integral from 3 to infinity of 1 over square root of x dx, otherwise known as 3 to infinity 1 over x to the 1 half dx. Therefore, we get something just like the previous problem. 
we have that since our original integral will always be larger than the integral of 1 over square root of x over the same bounds. Then by p integrals, our original integral diverges since 1 over square root of x diverges. In this case, because p is equal to 1 half, which is less than or equal to 1. So there we go. Again, keep in mind, if we had that this was, if we found that this was maybe less than 1 over square root of x, this would not be conclusive. 1 over square root of x is divergent. Anything that's smaller than that could be divergent or could be convergent. We don't know. It could, conver it could diverge to infinity, just slower, or it could converge. We're not sure. So the comparison theorem is very strict. You have to have something that's smaller than something that converges, and that leads to something that also converges, or something that's larger than something else that diverges. So the direction is very important. If we had the other inequality there, then we would lead to something that's not solvable or not helpful, and so we would have to look for another way to solve this, or maybe a different comparison. All right, so that, that's how comparisons go. Some of them you might need to do a little work like example five. The other ones like example four, uh, four, six, and seven, just really take a single comparison and then you're done using either P integrals or any, any previous integrals. So if you ever solved any other previous integral, you can always use that and cite uh, any information. I have a couple more examples, and these ones are integrals that don't initially look like they're improper because they don't have infinity, either positive or negative, in the bounds. However, they are both going to be improper themselves for a different reason. If we have example 7, we have from negative 2 to 1, 1 over x squared dx. Well, if I just try to solve that directly because I don't see many problems with it right now, this would just be negative 1 over x from negative 2 to 1. And so I just plug in those values appropriately, get negative 1 over 1 plus 1 over negative 2. So we get negative 1 minus 1 half, or negative 3 halves. Woo. However, this is wrong. The reason it is wrong is because the graph of 1 over x squared is very particular. The graph of 1 over x squared looks like this. Looks like that from 0 to infinity. And then from 0 to negative infinity, it looks like this. It has an asymptote at 0, which is between negative 2 and 1. So there's a discontinuity there. In order to solve this, then, what we need to do is take our original integral from negative 2 to positive 1 of 1 over x squared. We need to identify that discontinuity there and split up this integral from negative 2 to 0 of 1 over x squared dx plus 0 to 1 of 1 over x squared dx. And both of these are now improper because 0 is not defined in either of these integrals. So we need to split these up as the limit as b approaches 0, not infinity, of negative 2 to b, 1 over x squared dx, plus the limit as a approaches 0 from a to 1 of 1 over x squared dx. Now since we are approaching 0, we need to say from what direction. Here, I'm approaching 0 in the first uh, limit from the negative direction, so we'll put a negative exponent there, 
And then in the second one, I'm approaching zero from the positive direction. So we'll put a positive there. That way we just know the direction. Sometimes that may be important. Now if I solve both, both of these, I get the limits of b approaching zero from the negative direction of negative one over x from negative two to b plus the limit as a approaches zero from the positive direction of negative one over x from a to one. Okay, plugging in the bounds for each of these, we get negative one over b plus one over negative two plus the limit as a approaches zero from the positive direction of negative one over one plus one over a. Okay, we see the constants that we had before that led to our previous answer. However, now we see negative one over b as b is approaching zero. This is going to approach infinity. And likewise, one over a as a approaches zero. This is also going to approach infinity. So this itself, the uh, overall system is going to approach infinity plus infinity or infinity. This is divergent. So it does not converge to negative three halves like we had before, which shouldn't even make sense anyway, the area being negative. So you, that's why we need to be careful moving forward of whatever function we're taking and the bounds there. If there's a discontinuity or something, we do need to be aware of that. So always think about what that function looks like and make sure it's defined over that region. As a last example, we have the integral from zero to three, dx over x minus one to the two thirds. All right, looking at this, x minus one on the bottom, that means that this has a discontinuity at x equals one, because that would be one over zero. So one is the problem. So that means we're gonna have to split this up into zero to one, dx over x minus one to the two thirds, plus one to three of dx x minus one to the two thirds. Then that gives us a couple limits. In this case, the limit as b approaches one from the negative direction of zero to b dx over x plus or minus one. to two thirds plus the limit as a approaches one from the positive direction of a to three dx over x minus one to two thirds. And now both of these, if I want to rewrite this integral, x minus one to two thirds is the same thing as x minus one to the negative two thirds dx, which is a little bit easier. So I'm gonna rewrite those integrals like that x minus one to the negative two thirds dx. If you want, you could do a u substitution here, setting u to be x minus one and du to be dx. That makes this a little bit easier to work with, but what you'll get from this is the limit as b approaches one from the negative direction of, uh, this will be three times x minus one to the one third from zero to B plus the limit as A approaches one from the positive direction of three times X minus one to the one third from A to three. Again, you can get this using U substitution and then thinking about this exponent increasing by one and dividing by one over one third, which is three. That's how you should get this. But you can work that out on your own if you so please. And then we consider what happens as we approach one. So let's start plugging things in. Limit as B approaches one from the negative direction. First, if I plug in B, I get three B minus one to the one third. Minus if I plug in zero, I get negative one to the one third. 
which is itself a negative 1, because negative 1 to the third power is negative 1. So we get a plus 1 here. And we get the same thing over here, more or less. 3a minus 1 to the 1 third. And if I plug in 3, I get 3 minus 2, or 3 minus 1 is 2, and 2 to the 1 third. So we get minus 3 times 2 to the 1 third power. Oh, actually, this should be a plus 3, shouldn't it? Yeah, to multiply that 3. Okay. Now, thinking about what happens with all of these, now that this no longer has a fraction, no negative exponents, there's not really too big of a problem. As b approaches 1 from either the negative or the positive direction, this is going to approach 0 in both cases. So we have 3 from the first limit plus negative 3 times 2 thirds, or 2 to the 1 third from the second limit. And if you do this, you'll get 3 minus 3 times 2 to the 1 third is approximately it's approximately negative. No, that doesn't make sense. Oh, these should be flipped. Sorry. It should be 3 times 2 to the 1 third minus 3 of a minus 1 to the 1 third. And that one going to zero. So that goes to zero. So then you get a plus here. Yeah, okay. So you add these together and you get about 6.7798 if you keep that as a decimal. So it converges. All right. So that's how you deal with them. I, I've done quite a few examples here showing some that converge, some that diverge, how to compare some of them just to solve an answer, uh, how to solve for the full answer if necessary, etc. Uh, with that said, you should be good to try the problems for this section on your own. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments below or ask your instructor directly. With that said, I hope you have a nice day.